really want to do something a little bit different this morning and just kind of take this whirlwind tour through sort of the whole Bible between Genesis and Revelation. And the reason for that is, is that it pretty much takes the whole Bible to answer a central question. And the question is on your inserts right there at the top, you know, in Latin. Yes. Have you heard the term quo vadis before? Or the question quo vadis? And there's a novel by that name. There's a 1951 movie by that name. Um, but the whole thing is Covatus Domini. Covatus Domini. Where are you going, Lord, is the, is the question. How do we find out where the Lord is going so that we can scamper after? I mean, that's really the central question, isn't it? Isn't that what we all want to know? How do we follow the Lord? Where are you going, Lord? It's the question that Peter asked Jesus twice. Well, let me put it this way. He asks it once in Scripture, and he asks it again in an apocryphal book, the Apocryphal Acts of Peter, which is probably written around the middle of the second century. There's lots of other books besides the ones that got into the Bible, you know, that were written by the followers of Jesus and the Christian community, and only certain ones got in the Bible by the fourth century, and uh, the Acts of Peter didn't. But at the Last Supper, as Jesus is going to the cross, before he's going to the cross, Jesus asks him, and in the Latin translation that Jerome did in the 4th century, it's, Quo vadis Domini? Where are you going, Lord? And Jesus tells him, where I'm going, you can't follow. Not now, but you will later. And he says, what are you talking about? I'll follow you anywhere. I'll lay down my life for you. And that's when Jesus turns to him and says, before the cock crows this morning, you will have denied me three times. It's interesting that, Jesus, uh, that Peter asked the question, Covatus, where are you going? Right before one of his epic failures to launch, right? <laughs> and the funny and the inter- well, funny, interesting thing is, is in the extra canonical story, in the Acts of Peter, he does the same thing. The story is that he and Paul are in Rome under the uh, Emperor Nero during the time of Nero's persecution of the Christians. And the noose is tightening, and Peter is about to be caught, arrested and executed, crucified himself. And his friends are begging him, leave the city, leave the city. And so he finally relents, and he does. But he says, I want to go by myself. And he goes through the southeastern portion of Rome to the Appian Way, and he starts off on foot. And he doesn't even get to the city limits before he sees Jesus coming toward him into the city. And what does he ask him? Quo vadis, Domini? Where are you going, Lord? And he says, well, if you're going this way, then I'm going to be crucified again. And, of course, this is Peter's vision. This is Peter's understanding that he was going in the wrong direction, that he needed to go back, that he needed to be with his church, with his flock, with his people. He needed to be making the full expression of his faith as model. And so now, instead of fearfully but joyfully, he goes back into Rome. And when he is captured and when he is arrested, he demands that he be crucified upside down because he's not worthy of being crucified in the same way as his Lord. But Kovatis, where are you going? I think this is a central question that we should all be asking. And everybody has asked since the beginning, since the earliest times. What we're really asking of God is, where are you going? What does this all mean? What are we doing here? How can we be a part of this? And the truth is that the answer doesn't come all at once. It's way too big for that. It evolves slowly over time. As we get on the journey, as we start moving in some direction that we think the Lord is going, things start to become clearer as we move, but they don't come all at once. And this is true for individuals, but it's also true for us as a race, for all of humankind. We can look and we can see how mankind from earliest recorded history to now is slowly evolving. And you might not think that that's particularly true as you read Facebook and Twitter and and look at the 24-7 news cycle because we are still pretty barbaric. But for all of that barbarism that we're still expressing and, and perpetrating now to each other, if you go back into human history, Human sacrifice was the norm. It was the way of appeasing the gods. It was the way of getting things that you wanted to get. And that moved into animal sacrifice. And then that moved into some sort of penance and self-flagellation and other ways of mortifying the body in order to be able to appease this god and move forward. And then eventually it's moved now into amends and forgiveness and other ways of dealing with these problems that are much more humane, much more evolved. 
You know, at least in certain parts of the world, we can see that there is a sleep, there is a shape, there is an evolution in human understanding and awareness. And scripture is the record of that. And this is the thing about scripture, because we have been taught, I know I was taught, and probably most of you were too, that scripture is completely and fully formed. That it is inerrant and it is perfect in every way. And every word is just what God wanted to say. And so when you look at scripture that way as a block, that everything, then it creates all these questions for us. Why does the Old Testament look so much more barbaric than the New Testament? even though the New Testament is pretty barbaric in many ways. Why, what, what, what's the difference in that? Why does God look angry over here, and why does he look benevolent and loving over here? What's going on? Well, how about if we look at Scripture, the way that most scholars, as they read it, and if you look at the internal evidence, I think you'll see the same thing, that what it really is is a record of a people's relationship with God, the Jews' relationship with God. It is a Hebrew book, both Testaments, you know, the old and the new, the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures were all written by Jews, the first Jewish followers of Jesus. And so this is the record of the Jewish nation's relationship with God as it moves through history. And as Richard Rohr has said, it contains the problem as well as the solution. It contains where we've been as well as where we're going. If you really read it, if you really read it with an open mind, you'll see it's all there. The beautiful thing about the scripture is it whitewashes nothing. It shows everybody in their glory and everybody in their worst moments. Peter trying to follow Jesus when he couldn't even say that he was his follower to someone at a campfire. You know, all those things are there. And we see the people moving, the sweep of human history moving. We see Paul in his letters working things out. The commandments, the exhortations, the advice that he gave the churches, he'd often say, hey, I'm still working this out. I'm not sure that I'm right here. I'm not sure that this is of the Lord, but this is my best guess. I'm paraphrasing greatly here, but read between the lines. You'll see it there. Read his letters. He's working things out. He's trying to figure out what is the best thing to do. Some things work. Maybe some things don't. But we have this record of things going through, and we see this evolution of Jewish thought. And then we see Jesus as the culmination of that thought. And that's the beautiful thing about being Christian. It's a beautiful thing about being a follower of Jesus. Jesus is the key to unlocking Scripture. Jesus is the way to interpret Scripture. When we look at how he did it, when we look at how his thought processes are expressed in the New Testament, in the Gospels, then we can understand everything that came before and the whole sweep of history. I know this is a different way of seeing the Bible for many of you, and it may seem even blasphemous to some of you. But stay with me for a minute, because we're going to take a look at this and see. Is there an ever-expanding revelation in Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, an ever-expanding revelation or notion of this presence of God? If we really want to know where he's going, then we have to be aware of his presence so we can see where it's going. And this is what scripture is giving us. And so let's see if we can chart a little step by step here the record of Hebrews growing in understanding of where God is going, how this presence works. If you go all the way back to Genesis, and I don't know if you're really familiar with the scriptures, but Genesis is the record largely of what we call the patriarchs. These are the individuals who were the first towering figures of faith, the ones that really started to figure out breaking through their culture, breaking through religious, common religious ideas of the time, which were polytheistic, there was a God for everything, where human sacrifice was the, the main means of appeasing those gods and getting what you needed out of them. There were men who broke through, women who broke through, into an understanding of one God, one spiritual being. And of course, the towering figure of Genesis is Abraham. Abraham met God along the road the way that we meet our friends along the road. He spoke with them, he conversed with them, he understood that there was a presence that he could apprehend. And he passed it on to Isaac, his son, who passed it on to Jacob, his son, who passed it on to the twelve sons. And especially Joseph is a torchbearer from Jacob. And now we have the twelve tribes who migrate to Egypt to escape the famine. 
And now we have the beginning of the nation of Israel, starting to look at Israel not as an individual person, but as a collective, as 12 tribes who have formed a nation. And then, of course, you fast forward some 400 years, and you have Moses, the next towering figure, who's the one who actually shapes the nation, who brings those 12 tribes, that, that group of Hebrews, out of Egypt and into the wilderness. And now there's a different way of understanding God. God is this wild, uncontained force of nature. He lives in the mountain. When the mountain is covered with cloud and, and lightning, you know, God is there. The presence is there. God is angry. God is something. We don't exactly know, but he's something. But he's out there in, and he's separate from us, and he's something to be feared because he's capricious. You don't really know what he's going to do. He brings plagues, you know. He brings all these forces of nature to bear. And so this idea of God as this uncontrollable presence out there in the wild, take a look at Exodus 13. And let's see how, as Moses starts to lead the people through into the wilderness, at Exodus 13.21, the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And so something is changing here. Now the presence out there becomes more focused. It becomes localized. And it's actually leading them, caring for them like a shepherd would care for his flock. And they can follow him by day in the form of this pillar of cloud, and they can follow him by night. And there's a sense of caring from this God, this presence. Still out there, right? Still scary on the mountaintops when Moses goes up there for 40 days to figure things out, but at least it's here and it's localized. The word for this is Shekinah, and it doesn't appear in the Bible. It was a word that the rabbis put together later, but Shekinah means settled or settling or dwelling. And the idea was that the Lord settled on the people and dwelt with them. You hear sometimes of the Shekinah glory, that you could actually see this, actually could see this cloud, actually could see this pillar of fire. But now this presence takes another step. As Moses and the Jews are moving through the wilderness and they start to fine-tune things, they create a tent of meeting, they called it. It was a tent where Moses and God could speak. And at Exodus 33, 9, we see whenever Moses entered the tent, the tent of meeting, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And so this new, this presence now settles at the entrance of the tent. Only talks to Moses and Moses exclusively. But now he's speaking, and the people, this is inside of all the people they can see. But notice, the presence of God, the pillar of cloud, descends and stands at the entrance of the tent, but does not go in. Still outside, more connected than before, now speaking to their leader, but standing outside. Now Moses goes up to the mountain, and God downloads all the directions for building a tabernacle building the Ark of the Covenant, building all of the accessories, all of the implements that they are going to need to build this formal, movable temple that they call the tabernacle. And the last six chapters of, of Exodus are all dedicated. I mean, if you read them, everything is about the building, all the specifications, all the craftsmen, everything that they needed to do in order to build this tabernacle to the exact specifications that Moses brought down from the mountain. And in the last chapter, in fact, the last verses of the last chapter, chapter 40 of Exodus, is what we want to read right here, starting at verse 33. Moses erected the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the veil for the gateway of the court, and thus Moses finished the work. Then the cloud, this is the cloud of presence, presence the Shekinah glory, covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, wherever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken. And throughout all their journeys, the last verse says, 
the cloud on the tabernacle by day and the fire inside at night remained inside of all the people of Israel. So now we see the next step. We see what's happening. They build the tabernacle, and now this presence of God fills the tabernacle. This is a huge step in this evolution of understanding God's presence in their lives. In the early stages of all religion, there is this notion of capturing God, bringing him into the tent, bringing him onto our side. He is now our God. He's not out there someplace, this wild, uncontrollable force. He's now our God. He's in our camp. He's in our tent. And here's this portable temple, this portable ark, right? This, 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 this tent of meeting. Literally, they're carrying God around in a box. They got him in the ark. You know? And he will come and he will descend. As soon as they place this thing at their next encampment and they set it all up, the cloud descends. God is in the box. God is in our possession. You know, if you think about it, it really is a beautiful concept. The Jews understood themselves as the chosen people because God chose to dwell with them. It's not that God wasn't choosing anybody else, but he chose to dwell with them, visibly dwell with them. They could see his presence. And now he was filling their tabernacle, and he went with them wherever they go. This Shekinah glory, this, this, this cloud of presence, was the proof that God was with the people. It gave them encouragement. It gave them hope. It gave them courage to be able to move forward. Every religion needs to supply this, to know where the presence is present, to know how we can enter into that presence ourselves. This is what religion has to show us how to do. And this is what we see the Hebrews developing, a point of presence, a place where they can go to meet their God reliably to know where he is. But here's the catch. Here's the downside. As soon as you create edges around God, as soon as you create a place where he is, then there's a place where he isn't, right? That's the problem with this. As soon as we localize God, as soon as we put him in a place, I remember growing up Catholic, we all knew where God was. God was in the tabernacle, on the altar. There was a little golden tabernacle with golden doors, and the, ho the consecrated hosts were in there. As long as the candle was lit, we knew there were consecrated hosts in there. And we had to genuflect every time we passed that tabernacle. And if you wanted to be close to God, you went to church. That's why the Catholic church doors were always open. They weren't locked during the day. They were open. You could go in any time during the day, and you could kneel before the, the blessed presence, and you could be there. But that meant as soon as you walked out, it wasn't blessed anymore, and that was the problem. You know, it was localized, this and that. And this is the downside. You know, we learn where the presence is, where the acceptance is approved, and we go there. Sure, we go there and strive to be there. We can talk about the fact that, you know, all early religions, they have to make these kind of distinctions between pure and impure, between sacred and profane, between legal and illegal, right and wrong, us and them. This is what we do in religion. And this is the downside. On one side, it's the beautiful thing to have the presence and know where it is and know that, as the Jews said, Emmanuel, God is with us. But as soon as we localize that, then what about all the rest of those great unwashed out there? Us and them, saved, unsaved. I've got Jesus in my heart. Why can I say that? Because I said the sinner's prayer? Because I go to church? Because I was baptized? Because of whatever prescriptions whatever ritual my denomination demands of me, encourages of me. So I've got Jesus, but I don't know about you. I'm all right, but I don't know about you. you know? This is the attitude. This is what happens. The dualistic mind starts working overtime. This against that, us against them. Then at about 1,000 BCE, another major shift takes place. David the great king of, of Israel, unifies the tribes, unifies them into one united kingdom. And then his son Solomon, about 950 BCE, builds the temple. Finally now, the movable tent of meeting becomes a permanent place. And it's a grand monument, a huge temple. 
Solomon had amassed great fortune, and so he was able to build this amazing structure for God. And when he dedicates the structure, he goes and he prays before all the people of the newly completed temple. The Shekinah glory descends and fills the temple. There's that beautiful song by Chris Felsen that talks about the glory of the Lord filling the temple. And the glory fills the temple, this grand monument. But it's not to last. Around 589 or so, the Babylonians roll through and they defeat the Jews and they leave in place sort of a vassal government and part of the population is taken away into captivity, into Babylon. And Ezekiel writes there, one of the prophets, he writes a vision in Ezekiel 10 about the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, departing from the temple, departing. And it's only a couple of years later because the kings that Nebuchadnezzar left in place aren't playing ball with him that he goes back in in 587 and completely raises Jerusalem to the ground and the temple with it. And the temple is gone. And the glory of the Lord is gone. And the Ark of the Covenant, covenant is gone, never to be seen again except in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know. Still don't know where that thing is. But the, it's gone. Now, between 587 and 537, the temple lays in ruins. But as the Babylonians are taken over by the Persians, the Persians let a group of Jews go back to Jerusalem. And they begin rebuilding the temple under Ezra and Nehemiah. But here's the interesting thing. From that point on, from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah to Revelation, there is never any mention of the glory or the presence of the Lord filling the second temple. Ever. You won't find it there. It's kind of a dirty little secret among the Hebrews because that temple stood for about 500 years until 70 AD when the Romans pulled it down in the first Jewish-Roman war. But there was never any sense, there was never any description or memory of the presence of God refilling that temple. And there's a pattern here, if you think about it. The pattern is that as soon as God is localized in a person or in a thing, that thing is removed for the good of the people so that they can continue to grow and they can continue to evolve in spirit. Why didn't Moses get to enter the promised land? Because the people were looking at him as the embodiment of God. He was becoming a graven image to them. The whole debacle with him taking water from the rock, the people were looking to him for their sustenance instead of directly to the Lord. And so Moses sees the promised land, but he doesn't enter, and he dies on Mount Nebo before going in. Now the people need to deal directly with their God again. Jesus, as he's going to the cross, he says, it's to your advantage that I go. Because if I go, then the Helper can come. The Spirit can come. You can interface directly because right now you're fixated on me. He didn't say all that stuff in Scripture, but that's the implication. And of course, for the Jews, all of their notion of God, all their notion of the sacred was wrapped up in the temple. The temple was a sacred space. Everything else was profane. Everything else didn't count. And so the temple is taken away. Do you see the pattern in this? God is bringing his people to a greater and greater revelation of what it means to be in his presence, how that works, what that actually means. And now Jesus comes on the scene and ups the ante again, takes it into a new place. Because Jesus, as he's going to the River Jordan to be baptized by his cousin John, guess what happens? The glory descends on him in the form of a dove. For the Gospel writer says that we hear God's voice saying, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The glory descends on Jesus. And Jesus, in John 2, verse 18, where the Jews are saying to him, this is right after he cleansed the temple, okay? He went in there and just wreaked all havoc. And the Jews come to him, What sign do you show us as to your authority for doing these things? What gives you the authority to come in here and turn over our tables? What gives you the authority to come in here and say that we're not doing business as we should? And Jesus answers them and he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. And the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. God's presence had gone from a building to a person. This is what he was trying to get across to them. This is the next huge step in Revelation. God's presence can't be contained in a building. 
You can't build a sacred space and he's going to be there. It's more than that. It moves more than that. But also, Jesus' body is going to be removed, isn't it? As he said, necessary for the helper to come. And God's presence does descend on him, and then he is removed at the crucifixion. What happens at the crucifixion? Scripture tells us the veil of the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the outer court was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now, this is no little curtain here. It's hard to know exactly the measurements of such things because we don't have exact measurements. But most scholars believe that this is probably in the order of a 60-foot high curtain that the Jews themselves in the Talmud say was four inches thick. We don't know if those are exaggerations or whatever, but this was no small feat. To have that curtain ripped from the top to bottom is a monumental thing. What was the idea there? It separated the Holy of Holies, the place of God's actual presence, the place that no one could enter except the high priest on Yom Kippur, and that with a rope tied around his ankle, so that if he died in there because he was not worthy to be in God's presence, you could actually pull him out, you know, and didn't have to go in there and die as well. That curtain is torn. The line between the sacred and the profane is being erased here. You know where the word profane comes from? Phanum is the, the word for temple in Latin. Profanum was the area before the temple. So profanum, profane, meant the area outside of the sacred area. And that delineation, that division, is becoming erased here as the, the, the veil is torn. And as Jesus' body is removed, then we have the next thing that happens. Because what's going to happen here is, Jesus' presence is being removed. What's the next place that, they, uh, that God's glory is going to descend? Take a look at Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from the heaven a noise, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Here is the glory. Here is the Shekinah falling on the people. What did Jesus say? These things you see me do, you can do, and greater things than these. He's not just doing this for himself. He was showing us how this works. In between, Peter's asking, Quo vadis, where are you going, Lord? And Jesus said, yeah, you can't follow me now. Peter didn't understand the meaning of what Jesus was trying to tell him. I bet he got it on Pentecost. He started to understand as these tongues of fire came down. And see, this is Paul's big idea. If you read Paul's letters with this understanding, you will see it over and over again. What Paul is trying to tell us as he's moving us from the law to something deeper, as he's moving us from the temple and from the ritual purity codes to something deeper. His whole idea is that we are the temple of God. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 6.19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? We are filled with the Holy Spirit. If we choose to accept the infilling, if we will build the temple the way Moses built the temple to allow the resting place, if we build that inside, if we clear the space, prepare the space for God, he will come. And notice the tongues of fire, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, the wind that rushes through. All of these motifs, these metaphors for what it is experienced like to be in God's presence all throughout Scripture. But wait, there's more. Look at Revelation 21. Verse 2. Now this is John writing about the end of the first century or the beginning of the second century. This is after the first Jewish-Roman war. The temple is destroyed. It is no more. He's writing to a displaced people. And at the end, near the end of Revelation, he says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, 
and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And then fast forwarding to about verse 33, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. There is no temple anymore. There doesn't need to be a temple anymore in the city. The tabernacle is simply among us, within us, in our midst. Do you see the connection to Jesus' notion of kingdom? The kingdom isn't out there someplace. It's not on the mountain. It's not standing outside the tent of meeting. It's within. It's among. It's all throughout everything that there is. We have come full circle here. As a people, as a race, to what the prophets always understood about their God. Take a look at Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. Everywhere we go. The idea of Sheol, the place of the, of the dead in the afterworld. I know you've heard me talk about Brother Lawrence over and over again. He says, even if I found myself in hell, this is a 16th century French monk, even if I found myself in hell, that hell would be transformed into paradise because of the presence of my God. Where does he get such a notion? Right there. Psalm 139, right? Even if I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. There is no place that God isn't. There is no place we can run from him. Ask Jonah about that. There's no place that we can go that he hasn't preceded us. And in 2 Chronicles 6.18, to put the finest point on it, but will God indeed dwell with mankind on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. This was always known to individuals, those who were most in tune with God's presence. They understood this. They wrote of it. They tried to teach the people. But they had to come along their own trajectory, both individually and collectively. In every generation, in every era of history, there are always individual who rise, individuals who rise head and shoulders above in terms of understanding God's presence. And we can take a look at them and we can see who they are. But most of us are products of our culture. Most of us are products of our time. We start with that notion. And it is hard to rise beyond that. It is hard to break through that culture. And that's why you see the sweep of human Awareness also growing, and the record of it all the way from Genesis to Revelation taking us there, showing us how it works, showing us how it goes. And Jesus standing at the culmination of that, showing us the absolute presence. So we come full circle. You know, God is back in all things again, within us as well as on the mountain. But now we know that we are connected, right? Now we know that we can be unafraid. Now we know that we don't need to appease this God. Even though he's back out of the box, and he's back in nature, and yes, he's uncontrollable, but we don't have to fear the uncontrollability anymore because we know something of him. We have connected with him as Jesus has showed us. Quo vadis? Quo vadis, Domini? Where are you going, Lord? In an ever-expanding direction. From our point of view, God has already expanded completely. But from our point of view, it's going to look like this ever-expanding direction, breaking down these dualistic ideas of where God is and where God isn't, whether in places or in people. So from a box to a tent, to a mountain, to a building, to a religion, to even a holy person, every one of those needs to be exploded to start to understand the allness of God's presence. That he is everywhere in creation and within us as well. That's what Jesus is trying to show us. That's what Jesus is trying to break through to his people and by extension to us. Every generation needs this message because every generation is starting from some local place, some parochial place, right? Some us and them kind of attitude. 
And look how Jesus uses Scripture. If we're going to use him as the, the model for interpreting Scripture, what he did, you know, I've gotten strung up on rails before for that and is not a, an accepted hermeneutic anymore in modern Christianity because Jesus used Scripture selectively, right? He didn't quote from everything. He picked and chose those parts of Scripture that were bringing the people through to the understanding that he knew that they needed to move past. If Scripture contains both the problem and the solution, if Scripture contains the record of our evolution, then not everything in there is going to be something that's instructive for us. It's kind of example by negative, right? When some of the characters act badly, we know that that is not a model for us. And this is what Jesus is doing. He never quotes from the book of Joshua or Judges. He ignored all the punitive passages, the imperialistic passages. Joshua, everybody, Jews going into the land and wiping it out and taking it for themselves. He ignores the exclusionary passages. In Leviticus, there's some several hundred injunctions there. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Jesus reaches in and picks one little verse. A thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. And he puts that as a sum total of the law and the prophets. Love God, love neighbor. He knows what the people need. He knows what we need to pay attention to. And he knows what we need to realize it where it is and its place in Scripture so that we can be part of this moving through. How to connect the dots, leading us to where God is going in our lives. Not focusing on where we came from, but letting Scripture really teach us. Jesus sees presence as everywhere, with everyone, within everyone, among every group. If we can't see that ourselves, how will we ever learn to love the enemy? How will we ever ascend to the highest form of love that Jesus is trying to teach us? Which is not categorized, which is not placed in a box, which is not for us and not them. How will we ever open up to the freedom that Jesus is talking about? The truth will set you free. What truth? That presence is everywhere. Freely available to everyone. Not everyone will grab it, but it's there. And God's presence is in every one of us, whether we like them or not. And we will never be able to love them until we finally start to see them as part of this unity, part of this whole. So there's Peter, Covatus Domini. Jesus, where I go, you can't follow. Not now, but you will. And of course, we end up thinking about the crucifixion. Jesus is going to the crucifixion. Peter will go to the crucifixion. But I think really what was on Jesus' mind is where I'm going in terms of presence, you can't go now. Why? Because Peter was still too afraid. He was still thinking tribally. He was still thinking legalistically. He was still thinking religiously. He was still thinking politically. And because he was still in that box, he couldn't follow Jesus. But 50 days later, the tongues of fire descend on him and he breaks through into a new understanding of what it means to be present to God and more importantly, what it means for God to be present to us. This was Peter's evolution. This is scripture's evolution. Now, what about us? Are we ready? Going to have to let go of some sacred cows going to have to let go of some things that you're still clinging to. And if you're not ready, that's okay. There's another moment coming around the corner. Consider it. Take a look at these things. Read them for yourselves. Don't take my word for it. Because it's all there. It's all laid out from Genesis to Revelation. The path that we all need to take if we're going to go where Jesus is going. Let's pray. Father, thank you for 
the pains that you have taken to give us everything that we need. Thank you for showing us where you're going, even if it's difficult. And thank you for the patience when we're not ready, or we start and we U-turn and have to go back. Thank you for not judging us for that. Thank you for understanding our condition. But help us to strengthen our resolve. Help us to be willing to let go of things that we think we know so that we can move forward and find the freedom that you're talking about. Father, we love you. And we know that you love us. Thank you for that love and thank you for that provision. Thank you for leading us like that pillar of fire and pillar of cloud. Help us to see that more clearly each day in our lives. And thank you for helping us to understand that we can only do any of this because you were already there, you preceded us, and you did it first. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's all stand.